Don't pray for patience. Have you ever heard that advice before? It's a common advice that there's an age-old Christian humor and bemused wisdom that pretty much fuels that statement. Do not pray for patience. Why? Why not pray for patience? Well, because the wisdom would go and, you know, that God is going to place problems and problem people in your life and more in your life. People who really irritate you are probably going to intersect you more in your life so that God can respond to your prayer and help you grow, extend your patience, mature in your self-control and patience. Uh, some of you have dogs. I know m many of you do not have dogs. Some of you don't like dogs. Amy, I don't think you like dogs at all. But some of you do have dogs. Now, you know if you have a dog, just like with anybody else in your household, you need to teach them to pray. I hope you're teaching your dog to pray before, like, you feed them and such. But you know what? If you've, if you've got a dog that's, you know, developing spiritually, that dog may start praying for patience. But the dog could get in trouble because the local skunk could come and eat the food right out from under your dog, and the dog just has to sit there because that dog is smart enough to know he didn't want to mess with the skunk, right? So, you know, praying for patience, God may put skunks into your life so that you can grow in patience. Well, there are deeper truths at play here, though, beyond the unintended consequences concept of don't pray for patience. And first of all, here's a deeper truth. A relationship with the Lord Jesus is costly. If you're not a Christian yet, I want to be upfront and honest with you about this. If you are a Christian, but you kind of bought into the kind of watered-down version of a gospel that somebody gave you, <laughs> actually walking with Jesus, following Jesus, is costly. When people came to Jesus and told him, I want to follow you, and I want to be in the kingdom, like I want to celebrate like in eternity with God, Jesus consistently told them they needed to count the cost. And he rebuffed some people and said, you better go back and count the cost. You're trying to buy into an easy, easy believe, cheap grace gospel. That's not what I'm here for, Jesus said. Christian faith, listen, is not an, a nice add-on. Like, it's not like, well, I work and I play baseball and I do this and that. And then, oh yeah, also, I kind of throw Jesus in too a little bit. If he fits my schedule. Jesus and Christianity are not a nice add-on. I'm in the Rotary Club, and I'm in the Kiwanis, and then also I'm kind of in a church too. It, it doesn't work like that with Jesus. Jesus says, whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. In other words, if you try to hang on to your life, when you die, you're going to lose it totally. <laughs> if, if that's, what you're, that's the way you've been living. But Jesus says, on the other hand, if you give up your life now for my sake, if you invest your life into me, you save it because you'll be with me forever. That's, that's real faith. See, Jesus is not, any of y'all ever use something like Amazon? Okay, some of us use Amazon, right? Jesus is not just another Amazon. He's not an online ordering service where I say, oops, I've suddenly got myself into where I need something. So I didn't talk to him lately, but I'm going to dial up Jesus. I'm going to connect with Jesus and order what I want from Jesus. That is not real Christian prayer, okay? Jesus is not an online ordering service. He's an all-in kind of God. He's God, which leads us to this second related truth. Not only is a relationship with him costly, but prayer is costly. I've been encouraging you for the last number of Sundays, and Dean will this coming Sunday, a week from now, encourage you to pray more. But I got to be truth in advertising here. Prayer is costly. I don't mean any old kind of prayer. I don't, look, all kinds of people pray. Zen Buddhists pray. Transcendental meditation people pray. Hindus pray. A lot of people who saw, call themselves Christians do their own version of spiritually connecting somehow with whatever's out there. I'm, though, talking about Christian prayer, praying in the name of Jesus. Okay? So we're, we're talking about not my way, but Christ's way. Chuku told a story in our Tuesday morning men's revelation study a couple weeks ago. It was great. He said, 
he was on this plane going from Lagos to northern Nigeria, and suddenly the, the plane seemed to be malfunctioning, and they hit headwinds, and, and the plane was all messed up. And Chuku said every single person on the plane suddenly was praying. The Muslims were praying. The agnostics were praying. The, the flat out, obviously, somebody like Chuku, who is a man of prayer, flat out Christians were praying, but like non-Christians were praying. People of other religious faiths were praying, and people who didn't have a particular religious affiliation at all were suddenly praying because they thought the plane was about to crash. And Chuku was just astounded that every single person, every man and woman on that plane was praying suddenly. Look, a lot of people pray, but what we're talking about here is Christian prayer, the way Jesus teaches us to pray, which is costly. Now think about it. In real life, you know, and we are talking about real life, is any relationship worth having costly? And the answer is yes. We have some people in our church family right now who are worshiping with us who are interested in possibly getting married at the end of the year. And I told them this morning at 830, you know, marriage is costly, right? If you're married, you know this, right? To live out in a marriage is you kind of redirect your life to match with somebody else, don't you? You give up certain freedoms to be married, right? Let me ask you this. Any of you parents, do we have any parents among us? Is parenting costly? Oh, you better believe it. And I, I'm not just talking about financially costly. I'm talking about personally and emotionally costly, yeah. Now, are there great blessings with it? Yeah, but see, this is the thing. Any, in any kind of communication, husband and wife, when you communicate, particularly over fractious issues, does it cost? Is it hard? Would it be easier to avoid? Yeah. Is it, but is it costly? Yeah. Is it hard? Yeah. But the blessings are wonderful when we come together, right? So relationships and communication are hard. So here's what I want to invite you to do today. If you've ever been misled, by a bad preacher or Sunday school teacher or whatever in some other background or history that you've been involved with, or your own thoughts or some so-called guru that you watched in a podcast or online who, who, who has given you a cheap grace gospel, an easy believism gospel, I want to invite you to ask the Lord to set you free from any of those misconceptions. Because Jesus is serious about faith and serious about the gospel. So, Here's, here's the prayer. I, I've got it in the notes for you. I have several prayers in the notes for you today. This one is this. Lord, set me free from any cheap grace counterfeit that does not lead me to pray and act in accord with, Father, forgive us our sins as we also forgive everyone who owes us. Actually, that may, may not be in the notes, so let me repeat this again if you want to write this down. Lord, free me from any cheap grace counterfeit gospel that does not lead me to pray and to act in accord with this. Father, forgive us our sins as we also forgive everyone who owes us. As we've been working our way through learning to pray, you've heard me say it different ways, but I've been saying it over and over again. I hope you can fill in the blanks on this one today. This is in the notes, and I've got it up on the screen for you too, I think. Our prayer lives and our prayer will be one of two things, two big categories, one of two big categories. Our prayers and our prayer life will either be, first blank, intentional or incidental. See, your, your faith life and definitely your prayer life is either gonna be very intentional or just incidental. Well, I don't really have a time when I pray, but you know, if something pops up, I, I talk to Jesus occasionally. How deep do you think that person's prayer life is gonna be? <laughs> he's, he's just praying, you know, kind of as a, as a 911 call occasionally, because he's too busy with other things. He has not built into his or her life a real active, deep time of prayer. And if his prayers are just kind of scattered, like just kind of well, what's on my mind right this second? And I have a hard time paying attention when I pray. If that, that's, that's, not, that's incidental prayer. What the Bible consistently teaches us to and what Jesus, of course, ultimately calls us to is very intentional prayer and prayer lives. 
Jesus' prayer life, his schedule and his commitment to pray, and the substance of his prayers in relation to his Father and the content were very intentional. Pray with intent. And this is built into the way Jesus teaches us to pray. So again, our outline, the way Jesus teaches us to pray, it's a model, it's a flow. There's a flow to this, very intentional. Remember, we've been working this out over a number of Sundays now, is the so-called Lord's Prayer. We break it out into three parts, okay? A, the address, and go back to the originating sermon on this, our Father, pray as his child. Okay, you can access that sermon. We address, we turn to God as our Father in an intimate, trusting relationship with him and in an obedient relationship to him as the head of the household. Okay, Father, that's A. B is, we spend some time on this, with may your name be upheld as holy, hallowed be your name, and may your reign come, your kingdom come. Those are the B, adoration petitions. We're adoring God in those petitions. They're adorational petitions, and they ultimately will simply be adorational as he fulfills them. But then C, and this is where we are right now. We were here last week with Daily Bread. We're here again today. Dean will be here next Sunday as well. Supplication petitions. We're asking God to supply us now. So whereas the language at B was thee and thine, your and yours, now we're at us and ours. We're asking God to supply us. Go back to the Daily Bread sermon last week, and now today, it's about sins and debts. Now, Jesus' prayer words and are, since I've given you this structure, I want to just tell you this. His prayer words were and are radically different at A and C from the typical synagogue Kaddish, the prayer for the holiness of God. Okay, in Jesus' day and on into the first centuries AD, the Kaddish, as it developed, you know, from the time of Jesus forward for the next centuries, the words are very similar with Jesus' teaching us in B, because Jews prayed for the holiness of God's name and prayed for his kingdom. The thing that's radically different with Jesus there is he's telling you, I'm the one who brings it. In other words, I'm the Messiah, I'm the Son of God. But the words sound the same. If you go back to the Aramaic Jewish Kaddish and then the Hebrew Jewish Kaddish, they're, they're the same kind of words about the name and the kingdom. Where Jesus is radically different even in the words, okay, follow me, in B, it's about Jesus. Jesus is what's radically different is I am the one who brings the hallowing of the name and the name is found in me and I'm the one who brings the kingdom. But with A, the Father, the appeal to the Father in an intimate relationship, and with C, what we then ask for, for ourselves, these are radically different than the Jewish Kaddish. Totally different, okay? And so we really need to pay attention. In other words, if you want to understand who Jesus is and what his theology is, you really need to track with A and then with C. And that informs B, okay? So, um, and, and, and the person who lays this out so fully, he spent, you know, much of his career, uh, Joaquin Jeremias, his study of the Aramaic Lord's Prayer back behind the Lord's Prayer that we see in the New Testament is very deep, and he makes this very clear in his analysis. So, here's the key to what we're praying for. Here's the bottom line. Father, align our hearts, words, and actions with your heart, word, and actions. Father, align my heart with your heart. And that's gonna be big for what we're talking about today. Father, align my heart with your heart. Father, align my words with your word. Father, please align my actions with your actions. And again, alignment is costly. Jesus teaches us, you need to be like your father. You need to align with your father. Love your enemies. Pray for them. Be merciful as your father in heaven is merciful. That's Luke 6, verse 36. You want to talk about costly, that's costly. 
which brings us to the costliest prayer, the prayer for God to forgive us as we, ourselves, also forgive others. Now let's apply it. Five, five applications here, and these are invitations for you to pray, including, if I hope you're still thinking about, if you've got any bitterness or grudges or any unforgiveness in your heart or in your background, start bringing this all to the Lord through this process. Number one, pray to our Father about my assessment of the cost to me of the sins of others that I haven't forgiven. Okay, we're just going to start off with what you think the cost is to you, why it's so bad to you, and the cost that you've had to pay for their sin. But I'm going to flip that around just because I want to keep moving here. Remember what David prays in Psalm 51, verse 4? David has sinned egregiously. He's committed adultery with Uriah's wife Bathsheba. David has called for the, effectively the murder of Uriah, one of his mighty men. He asked, you know, Joab to send him up to the wall at Ramah Amman. And he's killed off Uriah. He's committed adultery, and he's basically defamed uh, the name of the Lord and of the Lord's troops who are in battle. I mean, David has really committed a lot of sins against a lot of people. But in Psalm 51, verse 4, he says to the Lord, against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your eyes. So in other words, here's the thing. The cost to you versus the cost to God of somebody else's sin, I mean, let's, let's, that's a joke, right? Let's, let's be honest. It doesn't begin to compare with the cost to God. Put yourself in perspective, okay? Get off the judgment seat. Now, then let's move on from number two. Pray to your father, our father, about the potential cost to my debtors if they are not forgiven and freed. If they're not forgiven and freed from their sins, from their debts, their debt and their resulting bondage. Let me lay some serious scripture on you. Ezekiel 18, verse 4. Behold, all souls are mine. The soul who sins shall die. And that means eternal death. Do you really want that? And do you really want to put that on somebody? Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death. Okay, is your heart softening any? I hope it is. Number three, pray to our Father about the cost of my refusal to forgive. In other words, my rebellion against God. Think about the cost of Christ and to his church, what this is doing to his church, what this is doing to my witness in the midst of his church. If I'm a bitter person, if I'm holding grudges, if I'm not actually believing Jesus and letting go of these debts, what is that doing to my spiritual life and to my witness within his church? It's bad. This is bad. Okay, let's go to not only Jesus with his church, but also Jesus in your own family. What does it do to your parenting if you're holding on to grudges and bitterness? I've done a lot of pastoral counseling with a lot of people who say their parents were bitter and angry about things. Man, that messes up children's psyches for the rest of their lives and messes with their faith life. This is bad stuff. And kids can read this, even if you don't tell them what's going on. I don't know why he always got so mad about that, but man, he was, or she was really rough about that. It, it reflects in who you are. It's going to mess with people you love. And then what does it do to your own soul? Like Dean's children's message today. What's rotten in your cupboard? Sometimes Nancy cleans out the refrigerator of the cupboard. It's like, what was that thing doing back there? Ooh, that's bad. What's on your body? What's on your back? What is rotting inside of you right now? And what are you carrying around like a sack of trash that you need to let go of? How much poison of unforgiveness am I drinking and driving under the influence of? How much poison of unforgiveness am I drinking and driving under the influence of? You know the old saying, right? Refusing to forgive somebody else is like drinking poison and hoping it kills them, right? Because the unforgiveness gets into you. It's not getting into them. It's getting into you. 
how much is this costing me? Not to trust God's judgment and to presume that I can judge in God's place, to arrogate judgment to myself. Are you kidding? Let go of it. Leviticus 19, 18. Everybody knows the second part of this verse. Let me give you the first part. You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your own people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. You want to follow the first commandment to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and strength, and the second that goes along with it, love your neighbor as yourself, you better let go of a grudge. You see that? Leviticus 19, 18. Romans 12, 9. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, this is back in Deuteronomy, vengeance is mine. It's not yours. The Lord says, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. Now, let me give you something briefly here, and you can talk to me later if you don't understand this. Do not confuse forgive us our sins as we also forgive everyone indebted to us. This is not a quid pro quo. In other words, God doesn't pay me back with forgiveness because of how well I've forgiven other people. This is not an exchange here, okay? And my forgiving other people is not a condition precedent to Jesus dying on the cross for me, okay? Again, if you've got questions about that, but that, this is not what's going on here. It's being said in a way that is a flow. Let me let's just do this. Hold a fist against somebody. Hold a fist against them. Is your hand open to receive forgiveness? Okay, let's do this one. Point at them. Is my hand open to receive God's grace right now? No, I need to open my hand, don't I? Okay, so... Forgive us our sins as we also forgive everyone is a prayer of costly grace, for costly grace, trusting God with all my past, all my present, and all my future. And this brings us to number four and number five. You really got to go with this because you got to come to Jesus. Number four, pray to our Father about the costliest prayer. Is the costliest prayer actually my prayer? No way. Let's go to the costliest prayer. The cost to God the Father and to Jesus of Jesus' atonement for us and his intercessory prayer for forgiveness for those who are responsible for his crucifixion, which includes not only the people on the scene, but also whom else? You and me. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they are doing. Can you Jesus on the cross. They nailed him to the cross. He's up on the cross. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Go to him. Go to him. Not the bogus Jesus who supports you in your anger, but the Jesus who is real, who prays like that on the cross. And then number five, pray to our Father, trusting him with all I mean, every single bit of it, all of my past, all of my present, all of my future, opening my heart and my hands. Remember the hand. Now, I can't do this. I can't do this. I got to open that hand. I got to open that heart. Opening my heart and my hands to his forgiveness, which I will then in ter turn share with my debtors. Okay, I'm going to receive forgiveness, and I'm going to share that grace with others. See, I open my past, my present, my future, and totally trust Jesus' saving and healing grace in, did you hear me? In my past, in my present, and thank the Lord in my future, including eternal glory with God and his Christ in the kingdom. Kurt Thompson that, uh, does a lot of clinical psychological work. Christian psychologist says this, I cannot truly know the presence, healing, and regeneration of Jesus if I cannot imagine him being with me in the totality of the event in which I have found myself so hurt. Let me unpack what he's saying. He's writing about, he, he writes a lot about, do not forgive and forget. You've ever, you heard forgive and forget, right? Or forget and forgive, right? He says, no, 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 that's, that's repressing things. That, that doesn't get you anywhere because you haven't allowed Jesus to save you in the midst of what was so bad in your life that still is hurting you so much. See, you, you're, you're, you're guarding yourself and Jesus off from that. He's saying you need to let Jesus 
come to you and take you back through that valley of the shadow of death so he can heal you and you can understand how he's with you even in your worst past, your worst present, and can take you into a future of total regenerated, healed, saved you with Jesus. Got it? So don't try to push it off to the side. Don't try to repress it. Understand, was Jesus not God when you were going through that? Did God not exist whenever that happened to you a year ago or 10 years ago or 20 years ago? What do you think? No, God was God then, right? And allow him to let you see how he has guided you and he can heal you in the midst of that. God works through all things for the good of those who love him, who are called according to his purposes. Do you believe it? Romans 8, 28, believe it. So say, say this, pray this. Father, here's another of my prayers for you. I think this is in the notes and it's up here. Father, I trust you with all of my past, my present, and my future. I hold on to none of it. I'm going to let it all go. I give it all to you because I believe in you as my actual Savior, Jesus. And so opening my heart and my hands to your grace, I share your grace with others, even and especially my debtors that I haven't really, let's just be honest, truly forgiven. I'm going to take your grace, Jesus, to them. Father, forgive them. They did not know what they were doing. Would you pray that? I invite you to pray that right now, just in the silence of your own heart. Father, forgive them. They did not really know what they were doing. And forgive me. I did not know what you were doing in my life and your larger purposes. Set me free in the joy of the gospel of your grace and your providence in all things. And therefore, bring me to the goal of real prayer. Reformed Presbyterians, you know what the answer of this is, right? What's the goal of this intent, of this prayer? That I may glorify God and enjoy him forever. Set free from bitterness and an unmerciful heart. That I may truly glorify God and enjoy him forever. So set me free, truly, Jesus, to pray in the power of your spirit and forgive us our sins as we also forgive every single one of our debtors. In the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. We hope you enjoyed this sermon from First Presbyterian Church in Starkville, Mississippi. If you want to find out more about our church and our ministries, please visit fpcstarkville.org. If you'd like someone to reach out to you and uh, maybe grab coffee or lunch to get to know us a little bit better, you can go to fpcstarkville.org connect and fill out the form there. And if you like what you're doing and want to see more, uh, go to fpcstarkville.org give to give.